Yeah, we're, we're here. I'm, I'm really glad to hear, actually, everyone at uh, Game Jolt talk about the work they do, because it's actually incredibly synergistic with a lot of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, as she said, we're, um, I'm Ben Norsco, and this is Mohini. I teach at uh, Parsons here and run half of Antidote. And I teach at Syracuse University and, um, well, formerly at Parsons, and I run the other half of Antidote. And we, uh, at our company Antidote, we make playful experiences to come up with creative strategies to kind of understand the problems in our world a little bit better. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this isn't um, a, a, a process for creating games specifically. It's about using processes of play to talk about complex uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very much married to the idea of sort of a, a user-centered design and putting the player center to any design process you have. So in a nutshell, it's a co-design methodology that we've been working on over five years, and it's different strategies of co-designing solutions together to better understand the core problem. So um, just to give a little bit of grounding, user-centered design is a fantastic methodology to make good products, sustainable products. They've been using it for many, many years, decades almost at this point. Um, there is a famous case of a toothbrush and the innovation in changing the shape of it. So. Um, to make it, the toothbrush is made more usable for children after watching children not use toothbrushes very well. And so these, this is a sort of famous case of watching what users are doing, finding what they need, and, and creating the product based on those needs. Right. But a lot of our goals here at Games for Change isn't a product design, it's change. Mm -hmm. And change isn't, it's tough to hold. It's not exactly a toothbrush. You can't really grasp a change. Yeah, and what the way we think of it is if we were to use user-centered design uh, for larger problems, we'd get solutions like the app to end world hunger. And I feel like we're all at a place right now where we can accept that may not work. Although an app, it might help. It might help us understand the problems, but this isn't the only sort of solution. And this is why we created player-centered design. We, feel, we felt like we needed new methodologies to talk about larger problems and more mm -hmm. wicked problems than just a single product. Thing. So the first thing we think about here is change is not a product. Mm -hmm. I can't feel it. I can't pick it up. And so why should we use a product-focused development cycle to develop to make change? We should use a process-focused development cycle. And I think play is one of the most important things we can do to, be, to use in this context. Yeah, our big question here is not, it, it isn't what game can we make to fix a problem, but what can we learn from the process of play to create change? Um, and how do reframing wicked problems with play lead to creative solutions to those problems? And, and the funny thing about product design is there's already a process for this, right? It's called <laughs> hacking. If I hack a product, I find new ways to use a product in, in exciting manners. And in, in it makes a product better for use, but it's not the thing that people intended the product to be used in. And hacking is a playful process. Mm -hmm. You play with things until you find new uses for them. So really, we question ourselves with thinking about how can we capture that essence of play to tackle other larger problems? So again, play isn't a product. It's an experience. Mm -hmm. And as an experience, it's you're going to be unique to thinking about creating change in the world. This is us playing a game here, Games for Change, a couple years ago about poop. <laughs> <laughs> so in player-centered design, I, I guess at the center would be players. <laughs> and we talk about players in this way, play, people with agency inside of a system. We're going to talk about agency. Agency is really important to this process. Who went back? Yeah. Uh, agency is the ability to modify a system, right? And that's how we think of agency in our games and in our experiences. Agency is also a thing that traditional game designers say makes games more fun. In mainstream game design, we use the term agency when trying to find the fun when creating new games. And as a lot of game designers here will probably share with us, players enjoy having agency. Um, it allows them to feel more powerful when playing, and that's really the core of what we use in player-centric design. As Tracy Fuller said, you might have seen her talk yesterday, it's not about what you do in a game, but what you get to do in a game that mm -hmm. makes it interesting and fun. So here's, here's us uh, reframing a system uh, in Geneva this last year with a bunch of people who run large fleets of vehicles for people taking for like uh, the UN and refugee products or projects around the world. The people that were in this, this workshop were in charge of making sure a lot of people didn't die by delivering vehicles to them. And we talked to them over the course of a day, figuring out what types of choices and agency they had in these types of systems. And so that we could 
build something and talk about the types of choices they have and make better choices in the future. Mm -hmm. And this is all, the key design. When we're investigating a system with people, we try to find the players in that system first and ask them what's going on. So when we create something like this, which is sort of the end result, it's player-centered in that the play experience for the game in this case is centered around the actual experience of people on the ground. Yeah, and the fun thing about this project was we started off with a completely different game. It was a game about sending resources to crisis-ridden parts of the world. And our focus on which parts we thought were more important were really not what the players cared about. So we had to kind of do a 360 and change what we thought was important. And this process has happened again and again. And we feel that the stronger projects we make are the ones that are built with input from the players from the get-go. So what other factors have been overlooked? We can start talking about the power-ups that you might have in a game mm -hmm. system at this point, And it allows people to be more creative and find those new solutions that they may not have had before. And this is really sort of one of the core issues that we feel games are good at. And what do we try to do the things we try to do with all of our projects? And systems are hard to understand. A system by itself is not compelling. It's not interesting. It's not even evocative. But they have, when we position the system from the point of view of the player, the player can engage with it. The player can play with it. They can change the system based on how they feel it should work. And they're efficient the systems are efficient frameworks for visualizing the world. And there's all kinds of interconnectedness and complexities out there yet to be discovered. And we have new tools for graphing those. But when you do that, it's tough to see a personal individual mm -hmm. touch inside of all of this. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we think about players inside of systems first. Yeah, many of our projects, if you go check out our website, deal with climate change. And the reason for that was that I had a lot of trouble sort of understanding these giant global systems and where do I fit into it. But and if you have ever seen a climate change model, if it even has a human element, it's often highly uh, abstracted. It makes it hard to understand why should I care about this? Why should this matter to me? And I felt like that was a really compelling use case to try to change the conversation. Um, and by using play, individuals can have an impact on climate change models, and that might help them understand what impact they might be having in the real world that they can't visualize as well. This game is a really good example of that. What we're trying to talk about here is infrastructure diversity and resilience in the face of climate change. Where is the individual in this? <laughs> but if we play with these ideas, you can find the individual like uh, agency and impetus inside of these systems. And then it expands sort of the world as it now exists. How can we expose the impact that a player has on these systems? If you're a player in the real world, as well, we all are, and you can imagine the horizon of your possibilities in your agency, with play, you have the tools to expand it and to adapt it. And we, in this way, we feel like games are speculative fiction for like real world systems. We first sort of codify the system as we believe it to be. And then through play, imagine new ways to interact, and that creates new possibilities that people can actually act upon. And then play in this context, we're having a conversation about what we believe the future should be together. Mm -hmm. If we have these abstracted ideas of what systems are and then we play with them with each other, then we're having a great conversation and it's really exciting. It's why we're all here. It's why we're interested in what we do. Yeah, and with player-centered design, we invite people to design a playful experience with us based on their own experiences. So really, they're teaching us how to understand their point of view through play, expanding the power dynamics um, of well-intentioned projects, which can often get problematic. Core stakeholders are more often than not very vaguely related to the solutions that will impact them the most. And with player-centric design, our radical revision of this power dynamic is placing the player at the front and center of the get-go. So it's not about necessarily who's playing, but also who is not playing. How can we expand the number of voices of people in the process? And of building solutions, yeah. And if that conversation uh, is expanded, we can find a better solution for all of us together. Um, the, so again, we try to put players as an active participants as well. It's not just about asking them. It's about going back to players and talking to them. It's like, did we do this right? What do you think is, should be changed? Can we talk a little bit more? Um, yeah, and prioritization of this intent and context of change-making projects, make, which makes them more resilient, specific, and sustainable is really our goal. And the way to do that in our experience has been to bring in the stakeholders really early on and have them invest in and have a buy-in into the solution so they sustain after our engagement has ended with them. 
So we're not looking for one solution. We're looking for a process of solutions together and a process of conversation together. That's what player-centered design is about. And we leave you with the hope that strategies such as this will lead to a greater understanding of each other and the world one day. Thank you. Thank you.